and welcome to this month's issue of Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine podcast. With you is Dania Koja. I'm an emergency physician who practices in Baltimore, Maryland, and lives pretty much all over the world. And I'm Wendy Chang, an emergency physician and neurointensivist in Baltimore, Maryland. And today we're going to be talking about the Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine publication, which is ASEP's official CME publication. If you don't know this publication yet, what are you waiting for? It's a fantastic publication by ASAP, and they have two lessons in each issue. The lessons focus on the critical decisions that you need to think about while you're working in the emergency department. Some issues address the bread and butter of emergency medicine, and some are more cutting edge. It also includes lots of pearls, such as the critical EKG, critical procedure, LLSA review, as our listeners know, is my favorite, and other tidbits like the drug box and tox box. So let's get right into it. For our first lesson of the day, there is rough and tumble, blunt trauma in athletes. Thank you to doctors Michael Dries, Patrick Hanlon, Zachary Steffs, Christy Colbinson, Christopher Trigger, and Christopher Geyer. Wendy, we have talked about injuries in athletes before, and today we're talking specifically about blunt trauma that's particular to the head, chest, and spine. So let's start talking about the thing that everybody wants to talk about, concussions. Absolutely. Since it affects up to almost 4 million athletes a year, it definitely is a topic that I'm sure a lot of uh, not only physicians, but also maybe as parents and family members are worried about. It's often associated with activities such as football, hockey, soccer, basketball, and rugby, of course. Imaging is not the focus of this article. We can use things like the Canadian head CT rule, the PCAR, and the New Orleans criteria. But the key is that if we see a patient who presents to the ED with a concussion, we need to remove them from play until their symptoms resolve. Got it. So... We see a patient, we diagnose a concussion. What is it that we tell patients to expect? What is going to happen post-concussion in the post-concussion syndrome? Right. I think this is the part that catches most patients by surprise. The fact that they can have persistent symptoms. Oftentimes, these are associated with physical more than cognitive activities. And these are headaches, dizziness, fatigue, and photosensitivity. With these symptoms, these patients need to have kind of individualized exercise tolerance. All right. And what is the second impact syndrome that people talk about in the news? Absolutely. Well, it starts with a mild brain injury, and that starts an inflammatory cascade, which alters cerebral physiology. But then if you have a second injury on top of that, a more significant head injury, it can potentiate these effects and really lead to rapid neuro-worsening, development of cerebral edema. So it can actually be quite deadly. Oh, wow. And that is why we pull athletes from play when they do have a concussion, correct? Absolutely. Got it. So what other brain injuries do we have to worry about? Well, of course, you have to worry about other sorts of hemorrhages in the brain, whether subdurals or epidurals. As we know, epidural hematomas classically present with non-helmeted head injury associated with temporal bone fractures. There can be a lucid period after the initial loss of consciousness. Got it. So moving on to blunt chest trauma in athletes. Are they supposed to wear like armor in contact sports? I guess not in I all would. contact sports. <laughs> I would. I wanted, Wendy, I wanted to wear knee pads and elbow pads when I went on a Segway tour, okay? You did. I am that person. I wanted to. Nobody would let me. They said they don't want to be seen with me in public. But, you know, I I want to protect my body. A bubble would be so good. (laughs) So, yeah, why don't they wear armor and contact sports? Let's talk about that. That's a different discussion. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe with our discussion, people will be more inclined to wear more protective gear. Oh, like that talk we had about ski injuries? Right. That was awful. <laughs> not not the talk, the ski injuries. Yes. Makes me not want to ski. Thank goodness. I don't ski. 
So yeah, with blunt chest trauma that can occur in athletes, obviously you might think of rib fractures, and they're most common with ribs number four through 10. If you do have a patient who has fractures of ribs nine through 12, you actually have to worry about intra-abdominal injury. If the exam is consistent with a rib fracture, you don't need anything else besides just a chest x-ray to make sure there's no other associated injuries such as a pneumothorax or a hemothorax. Remember that rib number one requires really high energy to cause a fracture. And this can also occur if, you know, the athlete falls onto an outstretched hand, remember a foosh injury, or direct blow to the shoulder. And oftentimes they actually have symptoms that are presenting with posterior scapular pain or shoulder pain or pain at the base of the neck. So maybe that won't quite be as obvious that they have a first rib injury. So you have to be aware of that because think about the high energy injury you can actually have associated brachial plexus injuries or a pneumothorax. Ooh, got it. Respect the first trip. To be honest, I don't necessarily go looking for it, but that's a pretty great reminder. So how about the sternum? What do we do about sternal fractures? When do they happen? Also, it's very similar to if you think about sternal fractures with high velocity MVCs. And so in sports, you might think about a direct blow from a ball or some sort of combat or direct contact sport. You have to think about the potential cardiac injury that can occur. As we know, the RV is most commonly injured and EKG changes can be missed. And so oftentimes, if you have a high suspicion for a blunt cardiac injury, you should get troponins or get an ultrasound to look for wall motion abnormality or pericardial fusion. And the answer to every question in the world ever. Get an EKG. An EKG. (laughs) Oh, wow. Are are you now like not even taking a stethoscope into the hospital with you? You're just walking around in ultrasound. Is that what you're going to turn into, Wendy? It's better for current infection concerns. (laughs) That, That is true. So how about clavicle fractures? Yeah, the article actually goes through a lot of information about clavicle fractures. And I learned that middle clavicle fractures are most common because this is the area that's the narrowest. And you can get standard x-rays, but a serendipity view, which is a 45 degree cephalic tilt, actually can reveal the degree of displacement. I just like that it's called serendipity. I agree. That's why I had to say it. (laughs) (laughs) Excuse me, can you give me one serendipity, please? I agree. I'm going to try that next time for sure. Next shift. (laughs) There's a great classification table. As we know, the near classification for clavicle fractures. Most clavicle fractures are treated conservatively, um, but in athletes, you have to be worried about up to 15% can have non-union or long-term pain and shoulder dysfunction. So a lot of them end up getting better outcomes with surgical fixation. Got it. How about Commotio cordis. You, you just wanted to say that, right? Oh, yeah. You get to say serendipity. I get to say commotio cordis, okay? <laughs> exactly. Commotio cordis is one of the most common causes of sudden death in athletes, second to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and congenital coronary abnormalities. This impact will occur right before the T wave, That causes premature depolarization and stimulation of ion channels that perpetuates arrhythmias. So time to defibrillation is most important. You have to be able to recognize that this event could have happened, let's say, in the field and get the patient defibrillated. Got it. So I think if people are fracturing their clavicles and their ribs and getting blunt cardiac injury, we must talk about the lungs. They must get injured too? Yes, definitely. You can think of pneumothorax can occur, pulmonary contusion, pneumomediastinum, anything you can really think of involving the lungs. But it's important to remember that chest x-ray may not demonstrate pulmonary contusions very well early, and they really blossom 6 to 48 hours later. So if the patient has symptoms that you're worried about a pulmonary contusion, or maybe they have these rib fractures, you should keep them for observation. That's a great pearl. All right, well, let's shift gears and talk about spinal injuries in athletes. What do we need to worry about? Well, the most worrisome and the most devastating are 
unstable fractures and dislocations. These are most common in the cervical spine, as you think about the fact that it's the least protective portion of the spinal cord. You cannot wear a neck brace while you're doing sports. You can try. <laughs> I don't think that would work very well. <laughs> I would try. You know what? My bubble. I'm telling you, my bubble would work. Right. Our listeners have to remember that maybe, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of Tanya. No, but speak, on behalf of us. <laughs> speak on behalf of both of us. I don't I, like to get I, I don't do this. And nope, we're both neuro nerds, so we definitely don't like to get our <laughs> neuro actors <Nope>. hurt. <laughs> I know there's like four functional brain cells. I want to keep it protected. <laughs> right. So you have to worry about spinal fractures and dislocations, specifically in, in compression flexion type of injuries. So these can occur in football, gymnastics, ice hockey, any sort of diving injury or high speed twisting injury. You also have to consider whether or not the patient could have vascular injuries associated with this. So I would obtain a CT of the spine for evaluation, as well as a CTA neck. Great, Pearl. Think of vascular injuries. Well, how about disc herniations? You are not going to be seeing those on CTs or CTAs. I mean, it's not going to occur in athletes, right? Those are young, healthy people. They actually can occur. And interestingly, probably as we're talking, or a lot of the people walking around, a third of adults in their 20s have at least one degenerative disc in their lumbar spine. This goes with the whole, like, if you image everybody who comes in low back pain, you might find these abnormalities and you don't know if they're really associated with their symptoms. Most people think that MRI is the best modality for evaluating for disc herniations, but you can actually have a 40% false positive rate. And so I think, again, the key to using MRIs if you're worried about cauda equina, otherwise treat the patient symptomatically, conservative therapy. I mean, I have a much cheaper way to do this than MRIs. Just get a coin and flip it. And <laughs> that's, that's 50%. Right. So, I mean, you're, you're pretty close. You're almost there. It's that's 40, the Tanya rule, guys. Everybody adopt that. <laughs> and if you win, I mean, you keep 40%. that coin. <laughs> But I mean, 40% false positive is really high. Yeah. It's not like five. <laughs> Jeez. All right. Yes, so yeah. a lot of the spine imaging not only talks about this incidental degenerative disc disease that we see and things like that, but also spondylysis and spondylolisthesis. What are they? And does it really matter? Or can we just flip coins for this one too? That's right. I feel like definitely we see this a lot whenever we're getting spine imaging. And so spondylolysis is a defect in the pars interarticularis. It's essentially the bone between the facets of the vertebrae, and that occurs from repetitive stress. So in athletes, you're thinking about people who play football or participate in gymnastics. The worry from this is that as the repetitive stress causes cracking and fracture of this area, and with that, the vertebrae can actually slip forward which is the process spondylolisthesis. Majority of this happens in the lumbar spine, more common in men than women, but women will have higher grade spondylolisthesis. You have to think about it in people who present with persistent back pain, and the management is really based on the grading, the severity of this. Any athlete who's found to have spondylolisthesis should not return to sports until they follow up with orthopedics. They can do light activity and stretching if they have grade one or two, which is up to 50% slippage, which sounds really crazy, right? Obviously, high I know, grade. like half of your, your vertebra is not over the other half is not okay. Okay for light like, activity. <laughs> no, no, like, are you comfortable putting your coffee cup half the way on your desk edge? Uh, no. That's true. Yeah. So I think the key is if you find spinalisthesis in any athlete, make sure they follow up with orthopedics. That, that sounds like a great idea. Well, I think that for a lot of these things, I'm just going to have them follow up with, you know, an orthopedist and just make my life easy, but maybe not for everything. So kind of going through the pearls that you talked about, this was a lot of stuff. 
This is a great reminder of post-concussion syndrome and the fact that athletes should not return to play until they're symptom-free because that can be super scary and dangerous. That rib fractures, number one, are something that we need to look for, and it's often missed. Um, and it does require a high energy to cause a fracture so they can have uh, concomitant injuries with that. A great reminder that ribs 9 to 12 may be associated with an intra-abdominal injury. That with sternal fractures, you may have a blunt cardiac injury. So if it was a forceful trauma, then please get that EKG, get that troponin, do that ultrasound, and then manage them accordingly. That with clavicle fracture, you should get the serendipity view to look for displacement. That with pulmonary contusions, they are going to be missed on that initial x-ray if they're not that severe. And they may take up to six hours to blossom. So if you're worried about it, keep the patient. With neck injuries, think of vascular injuries as well and get that CTA. That MRIs for lumbar spine can have a falsely positive degenerative disc in up to 40%. So probably shouldn't get it if you don't really need it. And then last but not least, condylolysis is when you have a defect in the pars interarticularis, which is the bone between the facets from repetitive stress. Spondylolisthesis is when there is a slippage of one vertebra over the other. And if it is 50% or less, then they need to follow up with ortho before going back to sports. That's right. Thank you, Daniel. Well, thank you, Andy, for taking us through this. And there's certainly a lot more in the article that our readers can learn about facial injuries, abdominal injuries, etc. So moving on to our critical procedure, it is tick removal. And I do personally think this is a very critical procedure because a patient was actually describing it to me the other day. And I was like, I probably should check because they were really proud of their technique. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to be near a tick right now. So this article talks about a step-by-step method on how to use the forceps to grasp the head of the tick. Pull straight, do not rotate, which is a rhyme that you can remember. And remember that 90% of nymphs leave mouth parts in the skin. So that is disgusting. I feel like that is a good uh, sticker, a picture of the technique in pull straight, do not rotate. Do not rotate. Yeah. It should be a bumper sticker. I mean, come on. In Maryland, everybody's worried about Lyme because there's a lot of ticks and deer ticks. So just create bumper stickers. For our critical image this month, it is a great reminder that some thalamic strokes are purely sensory and the diffusion-weighted MRI may be negative early on. The images are really cool comparisons that are only a few days apart and show you how your physical exam and clinical skills are more important than MRIs. Again! That's right. That's two for two. No MRIs in this issue. (laughs) I agree. For our critical cases in orthopedics and trauma this month, it is a case of a posterior shoulder dislocation and a reverse Hillsax lesion. It's a great reminder of how subtle posterior dislocations are on x-rays, but you can look for things like the light bulb sign, which is an increased distance in the glenohumeral joint. There's also a review of how to do a reduction, operative and non-operative treatments, and then the reverse hill sacs lesion, which is an impaction fraction on the anterior medial humeral head. Great reminders. The critical EKG is about right bundle branch blocks, and it's a reminder that in the setting of a right bundle branch block, a slight ST depression and two-wave inversion in the precordial leads are allowed, but not in the other leads and you are not allowed to have an SD elevation. If you see that, think of ischemia. And now for our second lesson of this issue, troubled water, pleural effusion. Thank you to Dr. Srija Natasan and Jija Saida about this article. So I don't think we've ever talked about pleural effusion specifically as an entity. Well, I don't think that we give pleural effusion the respect that it deserves. Okay, well, let's get into it. When should we think about pleural effusions? So symptoms is usually shortness of breath. And the magnitude and the severity of that is going to depend on the rate of accumulation and the underlying lung condition. And patients may also have trypopnea. What? Orthopnea? Trypopnea. Nope, nope. Trypopnea. 
T-R-E-P-O, and then pnea. So trepopnea is short as a breath when you're laying on one side only and not the other. And that makes you think that this person has a pleural effusion. So now you can ask people that. Great. This is a great tip for all of our medical students on your rotation. <laughs> ask about trepopnea until you're attending that. Yep. And now you have a new word to add to your spelling as well. <laughs> New word for dictation to not recognize. <laughs> so other symptoms other than trypopnea are symptoms of the cause itself. So ask about like cough, fever, chest pain, and things like that. Ask if patients have an obvious cause for their pleural effusion, like CHF, renal failure, cirrhosis, inflammatory disorders like lupus or rheumatoid, a recent procedure like cabbage or endoscopy. And remember that pleural effusions can be caused by things that are outside of the chest itself, such as pancreatitis, and that's a pretty big thing, and medications as well. The article has a fantastic table that divides the pleural effusion by cause, and it divides it as transidate and exudate. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a, in a little bit. What I found super interesting is that pleural effusion can actually happen after a laparotomy that's just, you know, a thing. It's not a complication. And in 10% of healthy postpartum individuals. I see. All right. What about physical exam findings? Take us back. With a physical exam, like the textbook stuff, there's like the dullness to percussion and asymmetric lung expansion. And those two things are the most two specific signs. There are other things like decreased vocal fremitus and bronchial breathing. The article says that the threshold is around like 300 mLs of pleural effusion for you to find these physical exam findings. I think in the ED, unless you fill up an entire lung, I'm not getting here anything, especially with these sad little yellow stethoscopes that we all have to use now with the current situation. That's right. We're going to go back to percussion. Um, I'm going to go back to imaging. Ultrasound. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we figure out why a patient has a pleural fusion? So... In order for us to figure that out, we need to first decide, is that fluid a transidate? So like from a systemic disease, like CHF or renal failure, or is it an exudate, like a paranomonic effusion, malignancy, PE, or viral illness, depending on that fluid analysis? Okay. Fluid analysis, you're going to have to remind us, what do we test for? So you need to look at the appearance, do a cell count with diff, cytology, a pH, which is super interesting, glucose, protein, and LDH, adenosine, deaminase, and cultures. That's a lot. I hope there's an order set. <laughs> I'm sure there's an order set. If there isn't, please create one. <laughs> so with the appearance, the only helpful visual diagnoses are empyema and chylothorax. Everything else, whether it's bloody or straw-colored or whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. The cell count with diff, Remember that the white blood cell count does not differentiate a transidate from an exudate. However, it tends to be that paranomonic effusion are going to have more than 10,000 whites. Empyema is going to have more than 100,000. And the diff is pretty important because if you see lots of neutrophils, think that it's a paranomonic effusion, a PE or pancreatitis. And if there's a lot of lymphocytes, it's either cancer or TB until proven otherwise. If the pH is acidotic, so if it is 7.3 or less, then it's good. think of infections and think of esophageal rupture, and that's going to play a part in us deciding whether or not to drain it. The glucose, if it is low, so less than 60, which is, you know, what we think of for serum, or if it's half the serum, then think of paranomonic effusions, empyema, malignancy, or tuberculosis, or rheumatoid. What's also interesting is that if the glucose is higher than the serum level, then think of an either an esophageal rupture, a central line complication, so you're actually just pumping glucose into the pleural space, or in a patient with peritoneal dialysis. The two most important things that are going to help us figure out if it's transidate or exudate are the protein and LDH. If it's more than three grams per deciliter, it's exudate, and it's much, much higher than think of multiple myeloma. If the LDH is higher than 300, then you're probably thinking of exudate. Oh, I remember. That's the light criteria. Absolutely. So the light criteria are the criteria that you would use to say that someone has an exudate as their effusion. And what you do is you basically compare the effusion stuff 
to the serum stuff, so the protein and the LDH. Keep in mind that when you're comparing them to the serum, they don't have to be drawn at the exact same moment. It could be a few days apart. When the effusion protein to the serum protein is more than half, then that's one of the criteria. If the effusion LDH to the serum LDH is more than 0.6, or if the effusion LDH is more than two-thirds the upper limit of LDH, then all these three criteria are what like criteria is. If they meet any one of them, then it's an exudate. However, keep in mind that if someone is taking a diuretic, the light criteria is not as specific and it may misidentify a transudate as an exudate, especially if it's barely meeting the criteria. I see. Are there any other tests that we can do? Well, a couple more things to think about is a hematocrit. And if the hematocrit is more than half of the blood's hematocrit, then it's a hemothorax. And the way you get the hematocrit is by dividing the RBC count in the fluid by 100,000. You can get an amylase if you're worried about esophageal rupture or pancreatitis. And triglycerides if you're worried about chylothorax, and that would happen from trauma or cancer. Okay. What about imaging? Well, imaging diagnoses the effusion, and sometimes it can help us figure out what the cause is as well. Chest x-ray is pretty decent. Lateral x-rays can show you fluid that's 50 mLs or more. In PA images or PHS x-rays, it's 150 ml or more. A lateral decubitus increases the sensitivity, and so does a Hessen view, which is a lateral and an incline of 20%. That would help you see that effusion a little bit better. Keep in mind that an anteroposterior x-ray is going to underestimate the fluid, and the common thing that we know to look for is that blunting of the costophrenic angle. Well, we've just learned another special view. Hessen view. Well, it does not sound as cool as a serendipity view. But both are cool. Both help us in our care of our patients. That is correct. What about ultrasound then? So ultrasound is more sensitive and specific. And the article mentions that you can see as little as five mLs of pleural effusion. I'm assuming it's an expert hand in the correct position when no one's trying to steal your ultrasound from you to take it to the next room. What about CT? So CT is more sensitive than chest x-ray, especially in differentiating pleural thickening from pleural effusion, which can really trick you on chest x-rays. And the big, big thing with CTs is that it helps you diagnose underlying pulmonary embolisms, which you should probably diagnose if that's what you're worried about. That's right. Okay. Now, when do we have to do a thoracentesis? So thoracentesis are either diagnostic or therapeutic. Just leave small effusions alone. There is a really high risk of iatrogenic complications. You should definitely do a therapeutic thoracentesis for large effusions. So if they are more than half the hemithorax, if there are loculations, if they're acidotic, so if their pH is 7.2 or less, if you have something with a positive culture or a low glucose, just drain those. Interesting. Okay, any other procedural pearls? Beware of the re-expansion pulmonary edema with rapid drainage of more than a liter and a half of the pleural effusion. Also, keep in mind that you may need to use a larger chest tube for a hemothorax because the blood can actually clot in the smaller chest tubes. And bring your friend, the ultrasound. That's right. What else do we have to do? How else do we treat other causes? So the most important thing is to treat the underlying cause. So use antibiotics for pneumonia, a chemo or keep an indwelling catheter for cancer, anticoagulation for pulmonary embolism, diuresis for CHF, diuretics and a liver transplant or tips for severe cirrhosis. Stop the medicines that cause it if it's med-induced and so on. Any special considerations for kids? Well, remember, light criteria is not made for kids. And in kids, the differential is so much easier because 75% of their effusions are prior mnemonic and the other majority is in pyema. Well, that was a great article and lesson about pleural effusions. I learned that there are way many more causes of pleural effusions than the common ones we typically talk about in the ED. So definitely check out table one, which breaks it down, like Danielle mentioned, by transudative versus exudative causes. Remember that getting a chest x-ray in the lateral decubitus view or the Hessen view can increase your sensitivity in detecting a pleural effusion. But of course, ultrasound is also a great tool, especially if you're experienced in using it. 
If you do do fluid analysis, the appearance can only help you with identifying empyemas or chylothorax. You will need a number of tests, including cell count with differential glucose, protein, pH, LDH, adenosine, DMNA, cytology, and culture to help you really figure out what is the etiology. But beware of diuretics because that can affect your results. Large volume thoracentesis can also cause re-expansion pulmonary edema, so beware of that. Well, that's a great summary, Wendy. Thank you for going through it, and thank you again to the authors for writing an article and making us respect pleural effusion the way it needs to be respected. And now to the LLSA review. I know you've been waiting for this all issue, Wendy, so we're going to talk about it. This is about non-penetrating eye injuries in children. And... We keep talking about eyes and children, so we decided to put this in a combo. Oh, there's a great picture of eyeballs, which I find very gross, but there are big <laughs> pearls in this article. Hey, it's better than a picture of a tick getting squeezed out with tweezers, so That's right. I would take that any day. That is right. So there are four great pearls for managing and evaluating pediatric ocular trauma. The first thing is you have to evaluate for coexisting trauma. You also have to assess for globe rupture. And don't forget about getting a visual acuity assessment. And then remember to ask and consult a specialist when it's appropriate. This particular section talks about the management of corneal abrasions, ocular burns, traumatic hyphema, orbital fracture, and subacute presentations of non-penetrating eye injury in children. All right, so how about you give us one pearl for each of these important diagnoses? Okay, so for corneal abrasions, just like for adults, you want to provide prophylactic topical antibiotic. For ocular burns, whether it's from household chemicals, you really want to irrigate the eye. And it's recommended that you want to irrigate it for at least 30 minutes or until the pH normalizes. That's a lot of irrigation. That is. And to make a kid tolerate that, I don't know how that's done. So the article does mention that you should be using a child life specialist or a papoose. A papoose with some magical lights and a Xbox. <laughs> well, they can't really play the Xbox. Man. I don't think you can do that if you're trying to irrigate their eye. Okay. Some or Xbox. ketamine. Yes, that's that's who. <laughs> uh, joking aside, I mean, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do because, as you said, it needs to be for 30 whole minutes. Yeah. Oof. Well, for traumatic hyphema, you have to think about diseases that can increase the risk of repeat hemorrhage, such as in sickle cell disease or trait, hemophilia, or von Willebrand's disease. With orbital fractures... You don't really need to get a CT if there's no evidence of entrapment. And then finally, for subacute presentations of pain, redness, or a light sensitivity, especially if it's 24 to 72 hours after the injury, it's most suggestive of traumatic iritis or uveitis. Those are some great pearls and reminders of injuries to the eye. For our drug box this month, it's actually about dexamethasone for COVID-19. And we did quite well. We kind of alluded to this throughout the article, but we did not actually say COVID until now. So what? Now you're just making up for it and saying it like six times in a row? Yes. The recovery <laughs> trial in COVID patients for COVID Oh therapy. my God, Wendy. <laughs> We've heard a lot about this trial, certainly on social media. It is a trial using low-dose dexamethasone, six milligrams a day, whether it's PO or IV, for a total of 10 days. And the results were quite dramatic. Ta, ta, ta. They found a 30% decrease in death in ventilated patients, 20% decrease in those who required supplemental oxygen, but no change in patients not requiring respiratory support. So really, you're talking about patients with moderate to severe disease really benefiting with the use of dexamethasone. The caveat, of course, is that this was released before peer review, so it'll be really interesting to see the final report. And finally, last but not least, is our Tox Box about acute nicotine poisoning. 
So this is mostly for kids who decide to eat cigarette butts or drink the e-cig refill liquid, even if it's one ml or like pretty small. So that can actually cause acute nicotine poisoning. One, this is an important topic. And two, I don't think I read the word butts in a publication before. So this is a very appropriate use for it. Um, so with acute nicotine poisoning, you have cholinergic toxicity of the nicotinic receptors. So this is like easy to remember the mechanism. So they were runny everywhere. They have diarrhea, sweating, bradycardia, and that's, you know, bad because they drown in their secretions and they get bradycardic and die. However, keep in mind that these patients may be tachycardic and hypertensive early on. The treatment is to decon as much as possible. So if they have it on their skin, just decon their skin. If it was less than an hour ago, then please give them some charcoal. Supportive treatment, especially with their respiratory status, and give them atropine for their bradycardia and their secretions. Now, if all you have is a report that a kiddo ingested a nicotine product that is not a patch, then just watch them for four hours and then discharge them if they don't have any symptoms. If they did swallow a patch, then you do need to keep them for longer, probably overnight, to make sure that they don't develop these symptoms. I see. Thank you. Well, our dear listeners, I hope that you have enjoyed listening to us today as much as we've enjoyed recording this podcast. We hope that you found this publication as well as podcast always informative, often enlightening, and never boring. Please connect with us and let us know what you think of the podcast, share your cases, and let us hear from you. My Twitter handle is at Danya Koja. And mine is at EM underscore NCC. And until next month, bye-bye.